Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to Library 2.013. Uh, this is so exciting. We're really delighted to have you here. Uh, our opening keynote is Dr. Sandra Hirsch from the School of Library and Information Science at San Jose State University and uh, the co-chair of the conference. Sandy, thanks so much for everything. So a big thank you to the conference sponsors and supporters. San Jose State University is our founding partner. Thanks for support from Follett this year and for hosting the Connected Librarians Day and to the Blackboard Collaborate NetWeb and to all of the great partner organizations, some of which are on this screen. We've had just a terrific amount of publicity this year and we really appreciate it. A free conference like this thrives on publicity, so tell people today to come and join us. This is also going to be part of the Connected Educator Month, and they've been promoting the conference uh, widely as well. And so at the end of Sandy's keynote session, you will be able to get a badge for Connected Educator Month, and a screen like this will come up that gives you the actual link and the code to claim your badge. This is the chance for those who are participating live to indicate where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for the star icon. You're going to click on it twice and then click on the map. And put a note, if you would, in the chat as well. Looks like Thailand, Mexico, Canada, Peru, I'm hoping. South Africa, Ecuador. Jamaica, Iowa, Maryland, how fun. So if somebody says they're not getting sound, uh, let's, if somebody wouldn't mind letting Matt know he can run the audio setup wizard. And we're going to move on here. Keep putting in the chat your time, temperature, location, but I'm going to turn the time over to Dr. Hirsch. Thank you, Sandy. Great. Um, well, I'd like to uh, welcome you to the conference. As the conference co-chair, I'm very honored to be able to deliver the opening keynote talk of the third annual Library 2.0 conference, this year called Library 2.013. My goal for this keynote presentation is to stimulate you to think broadly about the global transformation of libraries, library and information and science education, and our roles as library and information science professionals. We're in the midst of one of the most dynamic and transformational periods in the field of library and information science. The impact of technological change is now global, and the role of libraries and the professionals who work in them is rapidly and continuously changing. What does this mean for the vitality of libraries in our communities? What does it mean to serve a local community in a global information landscape? And what skills are needed by library professionals to help libraries thrive in this global information market? In this keynote presentation, I will provide answers to these questions while defining the opportunities that are available to libraries and information organizations, as well as the professionals who work in them. We are going to explore the trends that impact the information, technological, and social landscapes. I will then define the new roles and skills that are required of library and information science professionals and demonstrate what LIS education is doing to prepare current and graduating information professionals to meet the demands of their communities. In his book, Drive, Daniel H. Pink says, the secret to high performance um, and satisfaction at work, at school, and at home is the deeply human need to direct our lives, to learn and create new things, and to do better by ourselves and our world. 
I think this clearly demonstrates the transformative nature of our communities and therefore also creates the vision for our libraries. With the continuous emergence of technology, what it means to learn, create, and do better is constantly changing. Our libraries and the professionals who work in them must also constantly transform. We must always be looking ahead at the technologies that are coming up and how th these technologies will impact our communities. In order to become the technological hub of our communities and the technical hu technological hub of that our communities need us to be, our libraries must always be one step ahead of the technological curve. LIS education also needs to stay abreast of emerging technologies to take the lead on researching how these technologies will impact our communities and also the ways we learn, create, and develop and to offer continuous professional development opportunities so that LIS professionals and libraries remain a vibrant and essential community resource. So what are some of these global trends that are impacting libraries today? We're going to talk about some of those right now. We'll start by taking a brief look at the findings from the 2013 IFLA Trends Report, which demonstrates just how fast the technological time clock moves. According to that report, for example, the amount of new digital content created in 2011 amounts to several million times that contained in all books ever written. In terms of Internet usage, IFLA reports that Internet traffic has risen by 13,000% in the last decade, with more digital information created in 2008 through 2011 than in all of previous recorded history. This trend will only increase as new emerging technologies are introduced and as more countries develop stronger technological infrastructures, allowing more users to access contribute and learn through the global information landscape. So how will this impact libraries and LIS education? IFLA further forecasted the five key trends that will impact the global information markets and consequence, consequently libraries and library and information science education. These trends, which were just um, announced uh, a few months ago are that new technologies will both expand and limit who has access to information, um, that online education will democratize and disrupt global learning, that the boundaries of privacy and data protection will be redefined, and that hyper-connected societies will listen to and empower new voices and groups, as well as the global information environment will be transformed by new technologies. You'll be able to hear more about the IFLA trend report later today um, uh, when Donna Sheeter, who's the president-elect of IFLA, will present um, her, uh, her t a session on navigating the waves, charting the information environment using the IFLA trend report. It's a really fascinating um, set of analyses, so I recommend checking that out. So what do we mean when we're talking about emerging technologies for libraries? <clears throat> The Horizon Report annually evaluates and reports on the next emerging technologies that will be implemented by libraries and higher education in the near future. This slide shows the 12 technologies identified in the 2013 Horizon Report as emerging technologies that will impact libraries in the near future. On the immediate upswing, our some are what's called flipped classrooms, which use technology to help students learn actively and independently under the guidance of a teacher who acts more like a facilitator and a tutor. There's also MOOCs, or massively open online courses, which target large-scale participation and open access learning via the web. There's also mobile apps, which continue to engage students via the use of microphones, touch screens, sensors, maps, and other interactions on sm smartphones, and also tablet computing for educational uses. Other technologies reported on the horizon included things like augmented reality, game-based learning, the Internet of Things, and learning analytics. 
These emerging technologies will have a great impact on our profession in the very near future and for information professionals. Um, and information professionals will be increasingly in demand to help libraries, educational systems, and organizations outside the library adjust their services to meet the demands of their patrons, students, educators, and customers. These emerging technologies are also fostering new ways of learning. The Open University, a UK-based distance learning provider, recently published their Innovating Pedagogy 2013 report, which explores new forms of teaching, learning, and assessment for an interactive world. In their introduction, the authors state that these new innovations are not looking for an application in formal education. They are new ways of learning, teaching, and assessment. Be, being as such, these technologies will not only create opportunities in formal education, but in any organization that desires to connect with its community by fostering an environment of learning, exploration, and even play. Let's look at a couple of examples of how these emerging technologies are being used for, uh, for learning and engagement. So starting with MOOCs, as I mentioned, massively open online courses, have attracted recent attention and are being identified as an innovative learning opportunity for communities. One definition of MOOCs is as an open access online course that provides no constraints on class size. However, MOOCs are also taking on other forms, and just to name a few, uh, MOOCs um, are now, you can pay for them, or there are smaller size MOOCs often referred to as NOOCs or niche MOOCs. This screenshot highlights the San Jose State University School of Library and Information Sciences first MOOC, which is the hyperlinked library MOOC, which launched just in the fall and is actually currently underway. The Open University highlights the fact um, that MOOCs also offer the opportunity to integrate other innovations or emerging technologies in their pedagogy. These include the use of digital badges, learning analytics, mobile apps, tablet computing, and game-based learning, all of which were reported on in the Horizon report that we just discussed. So what is the role of MOOCs, um, what is the library's role in MOOCs? As we will discuss in a few minutes, research shows that patrons are requesting the technological resources to access MOOCs in the library. As MOOCs gain momentum among learners of all ages, libraries will become an essential resource for accessing this form of learning. With the wide availability and use of mobile technologies, including smartphones, tablets, e-readers, and the thousands of mobile applications available, learning becomes seamless, not only across devices, but across organizations. Students are able to access the library from home or school or on the go. Similarly, similarly through the use of mobile apps and cloud computing, students can also access their teachers, classmates, or online documents, all while using computers or tablets at home or at the library. The Innovating Pedagogy Report emphasizes that there is now greater potential to incorporate the surrounding environment with seamless learning, employing mobile devices as scientific toolkits to collect environmental data, record interviews, conduct surveys, take measurements, and log findings. In 2011, Arlington Heights Memorial Library in Illinois created a new vision for their library as a place to create and make things. By January 2012, the library opened a pilot digital media lab, which included a 3D printer where users create videos for business and personal use, digitize and touch up old family photographs, make original multi-track recordings, design websites, and add new job skills. These maker, um, these maker cultures, also referred to as maker spaces, encompass not only the process of creating specific objects, but also the social and learning cultures surrounding their construction. Maker culture also emphasizes experimentation, innovation, and the testing of theory through practical self-directed tasks. So 
The Internet of Things is a concept of a future where everyday physical objects will be connected to the Internet and will be able to identify themselves to other devices. The term is closely identified with RFID as the method of communication, although it could also include other sensor technologies, other wireless technologies, QR codes, etc. A new survey of IT decision makers by SAP and Harris Interactive indicates the Internet of Things is on the cusp of transforming our homes, our cities, and how business is conducted. Buried within the survey results are such nuggets as mobile devices will outnumber humans this year, 90% of consumer connected devices will have access to the cloud, and at least 4 billion terabytes of data will be generated this year alone. As you can see, emerging technologies, individually and collectively, will have tremendous impact on how we will learn, work, play, and communicate. As I've just demonstrated, the integration of technology is changing the roles of the library. Patrons are no longer accessing the library to consume information and resources. Um, they, are becoming, they are coming to the library to learn, collaborate, create, and play. Even more exciting is that patrons, the community accessing the library, are also now contributors of knowledge and information. I like this quote from one of our school's recent graduates because it conveys the new role that libraries are assuming within communities and how libraries are moving beyond one-way static repositories. Technology is helping libraries to extend and build community. Technology has changed the format of information, the way we access information, the way we interact, use, and communicate information. Technology is also changing the way we learn, the way we share, the way we collaborate socially, academically, and professionally. What is exciting about these changes is what it can mean for our libraries. Libraries have the opportunity to develop themselves as the technological and information hub of their communities. Libraries can do this by not only providing access to the technologies desired by their communities, but also by being the hub for learning and exploring with technology. Lee Ramey, the director of the Pew Internet Project and one of our Library 2.013 conference keynote presenters, who will be presenting later today when he'll talk more about libraries and communities, recently shared the Pew Internet Project's latest findings um, about the changing role of libraries and patrons' interest in new services. Results from that project um, highlight the community's view of where we are, specifically Libraries are both physical and virtual places now. Libraries have both an individual and community focus. And libraries maintain a collection library, that repository we were just talking about, and also foster a creation library. And there's something for everyone in the public library. So what's fascinating about these results is that they demonstrate the community's view of the library and how the community's view of the library is transitioning from that brick and mortar place to a vibrant place for creating, learning, and building community. Some additional trends from that same report of what library users want their libraries to offer found that 37% requested online research services 35% wanted a cell phone app so that they could access library services while they were on the go. 35% wanted a technology petting zoo so that they could try out new technologies in their library. And 34% wanted a cell phone GPS app to help them navigate the library. Clearly, this means that libraries need some better signage as one solution to that problem. Some additional findings from that study were that 29% wanted a library catalog that provided them with personalized recommendations like Amazon does. And then there were several findings related to ebooks, including the, um, that 28% wanted classes on how to download, view, and navigate ebooks. And 23% wanted instruction on how to use e reading devices. Additionally, 
26% wanted ebook readers they could check out from the library that were already preloaded with ebooks so that they could bypass having to learn how to download the ebooks in the first place. And then 26% wanted a lab for digitizing personal materials, which ties in with the idea of makerspaces we were just talking about. Another recent study, this one conducted by the Library Research Guide in conjunction, conjunction with Unisphere, was published in April 2013 and surveyed 796 librarians to analyze current patron-driven uh, demands on service and how they relate to recent spending trends of libraries. As you can see, uh, across all types of libraries, the top three requests by library patrons are for ebooks wireless access, and computer web access. These trends speak to the priorities of libraries in addressing the specific needs of their communities. As we look across these reports, along the visible evidence we see, um, along with the visible as evidence we see in our everyday libraries, it's clear that providing technology-based access is now the library's top priority as they redefine their roles as digital knowledge centers. In his 2011 white paper titled The Hyperlink Library, Dr. Michael Stevens wrote, when asked what I see for the future of libraries, I imagine a space where users will connect, collaborate, create, and care. That future is now. The role of the library today is a place that allows the community to connect with each other, with technology, and with information resources. The library is also a place where patrons explore, collaborate, and create. They create independently. They also create in groups, perhaps in community activities held at the library or through the library's creative commons. And they create online through a myriad of activities, all made possible through access to technology provided by the library. Let's take a minute, moment and we're going to explore evidence of, li of technology being integrated integrated and accessed in our libraries. The library is now providing technology that enables patrons to create content. This photo shows a library volunteer at the Westport Public Library's makerspace in Connecticut entering computer coding to begin running one of the library's 3D printers. And here's an example of the Escondido Library in California providing a program that encourages its users um, to learn and create with technology. Library U is a project to collect and share local knowledge through, through videos and podcasts. Users can watch a video, listen to a podcast, or create their own. Topics range across the community's interests, such as business and investing, history, gardening, photography, and self-help. The library is also providing technology that helps people connect. For example, the Fayetteville Free Library in New York has a fab lab. The library provides a safe and accessible space where anyone in the community can interact understand and develop through the use of the technologies available in this fab lab. Technologies available for patrons to use include things like a green screen wall, video cameras, 3D computers, podcasting equipment, etc. So it's a very creative space for people to use, um, work with technology. The library uses technology to also engage more deeply with the community. For example, here's a tool produced by the Edinburgh Library in Scotland, which uses technology to archive historical photos and stories on a virtual map. It features resources held by the library, but library users can also contribute to the map. You can navigate the map by it through a sliding timeline bar or click on pointers on the map to open up the images and stories. Through this interactive map, accessible by mobile phones um, and computers, the community is able to retrieve and to contribute to the stories, images, and historical data of this town. The library is also using technology to engage the community through play. For example, the Library of Birmingham in the United Kingdom uses a clever and creative method of crowdsourcing classification for photographs held in the library's archives. 
disguised as a Facebook app in an interactive game format. The player is presented with a series of old photos, which they are asked to describe with keywords. The player is given a number of chances to find the most popular keywords that other players have used to describe the same photo. And as they enter their answers, it adds them to the list of keywords used for that image. So as they're playing, they're also tagging the digitized image. Finally, the library is using technology to automate processes and interactions with the community. For example, the Christchurch Libraries in New Zealand use RFID for issuing library books in a children's library. It works in the same way as a standard RFID book circulation unit, but is designed to look like a penguin on a block of ice. You can place the items you want to borrow in the penguin's open book, and they're issued to you. It's designed as a fun way of engaging children in the library. So far, we have discussed some of the current global trends and the way that technology is helping to shape the new roles that libraries are playing in their communities, moving beyond just storing materials and into more interactive activities, creating, learning, connecting, engaging, playing, and automating in partnership with the community. So what does all this mean for the library professional? How is technology and its integration in the global information environment at our libraries changing the roles of librarians? <clears throat> An effective way to assess the professional needs of libraries is to analyze job postings. Collectively, these job postings paint a pic great picture of the competen competencies, skills, and knowledge libraries are seeking in order to fulfill the needs of their communities. Each year, San Jose State University School of Library and Information Science reviews over 450 job listings appearing in library-centric job listing sites like ALA, SLA, LIST, uh, LibGig Jobs, etc., and also in more general job posting sites like Monster.com, Indeed.com, etc. Given the trends in emerging technologies, it's not surprising that the results from the 2013 Emerging Career Trends for Information Professionals snapshot of job titles in summer 2013 reports suggest that new and emerging technologies, network and integrated library systems, and metadata standards for electronic collections management are some of the most frequently mentioned job skills. Other responsibilities mentioned included creating web and social media presence, creating and sourcing of digital tools, and implementing digital projects. The Library Journal just released the 2013 Placements and Salaries Report and reported on the top 10 job titles for information professionals. You can clearly see the trend toward more te technology-based job titles with job titles like data analytics, digital archives, emerging technology specialist, and social media manager. In reviewing the results of these studies, there are some common technology skill sets that are increasingly expected of library and information professionals, especially for the emerging job titles we just discussed. This graphic, again from that, uh, the Emerging Career Trends for Information Re Professionals report, demonstrates some of the specific duties that many librarians perform as part of their job. Some of the key skills include familiarity with integrated library systems, knowledge of cataloging and metadata, electronic collections management, ability to lead and complete digitization and data migration conversion, support for distance and virtual patrons, evaluation and improvement of current systems and workflow, anticipation and implementation of future or emerging needs and technologies. These trends have been represented by job qualification and competency studies worldwide that representing the global transformation of our libraries. In Kuwait, for example, the results of a Kuwait University self-study on the competencies needed by new LIS professionals 
New tracks of specialization were developed to address the needs of librarianship, which include information management, IT applications, and knowledge management. Similarly, Norwegian and Thai LIS educators found that the principal areas of disciplinary knowledge required included an understanding of metadata, database development, database management systems, and user needs. As the integration of information technology infrastructures continues to improve worldwide, the demand on libraries and the demand for librarians who are skilled, knowledgeable, and competent with technology and have an openness for continuous learning and adaptation will continue to increase. Again, drawing on the Emerging Career Trends for Information Professionals report, the forecast for job skills requiring, um, for jobs requiring the skills provided through the MLIS is strong. Uh, if we look at it, we can see that 71% of the job postings analyzed explicitly required an MLIS or, or an MLS. And some of the kind of key things they were looking for included reference skills, management level um, job skills, uh, technology centered jobs, teaching and instruction, and statistics and um, analysis skills. The prevalence of each job requirement listed here has increased since 2012. And as libraries continue to integrate technology and position themselves as the technological hub of their communities, the trends represented in these job skills requirements will only increase. The influence of technology in our libraries and the need for skilled librarians is stronger today than ever. Librarians, libraries need employees who are competent both in the foundational and technological applications of the library. Libraries also need employees who are committed to transforming themselves and their, their roles as well as the library throughout their careers. LIS education is the key ingredient for providing and sustaining library professionals who are qualified to meet the demands of libraries today and who are prepared for the community-driven technological transformation of the future. As I will de demonstrate in the upcoming slides, LIS education has a strong ear to the profession. We are watching hiring trends to identify the current needs of libraries. We are watching the industry reports of emerging technologies and how they will impact education, our communities, and our libraries. We are hiring, hiring faculty who are experts in library applications, in user behaviors, and in emerging technologies. So we can build a curriculum and professional development opportunities that meet the immediate and future needs of information organizations. In a recent San Jose State University School of Library and Information Science survey to determine the competencies needed of new library and information science graduates, library employers were asked, what top skills do they want employees to demonstrate? Their responses were, that they want effective written and, written and verbal communication skills. They want a passion for continuous learning and ad adaptability to new technology. And they want proficient use of current and emerging information technologies. As you can see in these responses, technology is a much needed competency of LAS graduates. This is further emphasized in the literature. A recent trend in LIS education is the opportunity for students to focus on a particular pathway to guide their curriculum as well as their competencies and their professional goals. We recently performed a content analysis to identify trends and pathways focused on technology that are being offered by ALA accredited LIS schools in the US and Canada. Of the schools where a pathway was identified, 42% offered a pathway in digital, libra digital libraries, which included courses like digital copyright, digital environment, implementation of digital technologies and programming in digital libraries. 32% offered a pathway in information architecture, design, and programming. And this included courses in web design, computer analysis, and the web, JavaScript, et cetera. And 7% offered a pathway in information technology, 
which included courses in automated library systems, information technology systems and education, preservation technologies, and more. As you can see, there was a strong emphasis on digital libraries and information architecture, design, and programming courses in particular at these schools. And LIS schools are providing an evolving array of technology courses that are necessary to prepare LIS graduates to enter the library and information profession. Another focus of LIS education is on professional competencies. This quote comes from an article that I wrote and that was published in Information Outlook last year and that addresses how competencies in LIS programs are preparing graduates for the qualification and needs of libraries. As quoted here, it is critical that LIS education consistently reviews the competencies needed as an information professional. As technologies impact libraries changing and changing user needs and patron demands for library services, so too will our competencies need to change to meet the needs of the profession. Many accredited LIS schools are addressing the technological competencies of the profession through the competencies required of their graduates. So here is an example of a technological competency that we require of our graduates here at San Jose State. It requires that students will demonstrate proficiency in the use of current information and communication technologies and other related technologies as they affect the resources and uses of libraries and other types of information providing entities. At the University of Mississippi, students are required to be cognizant of the impact of technology on the social and economic structure and the library's mission to the community. And at Emporia State, students must have the ability to employ current and emerging technologies effectively for communication and to search for, identify, repackage, and deliver information resources. These competencies are just a sampling of over 52 technological competencies found amongst 56 accredited LIS schools in a study recently that, that we recently performed that demonstrates, first, the impact of technology on our profession, and second, the commitment of LIS education to address both current and emerging technologies in our libraries. The result is that graduates of accredited LIS programs foster a high commitment to the professional and technical competencies. As Michael Stevens wrote, graduates of LIS accredited programs have the ability to engage and evolve with technology, impart technology to cross-generational communities, and possess a willingness to share, teach, and participate. So what are some of the ways that current information professionals can learn new technologies and invest in their lifelong learning? In addition to participating in conferences like this, there are many choices for information professionals that include things like getting a postmaster certificate um, or attending and learning as a, to, um, a postmaster certificate, which would allow you to retool and learn new skills, as well as there's lots of different um, short professional development courses and workshops that you can take from various associations or through other means. But one interesting initiative that I wanted to highlight was just launched last year by um, the San Jose State University School of Library and Information Science students and alumni, and it's called 23 Things for SLIS Students and Alumni, Essentials for Success. This program, which is currently halfway through its initial 23 Things, offers tutorials on social technologies, presentation tools, curating research skills, and more. Not only are the modules recommended by students and alumni, over 45 student and alumni volunteers are actively involved in building the modules, each module itself requiring a collaborative effort of four to five volunteers. In just four months, they have built an active learning environment of 160 students and alumni who are exploring new technologies and professional development skills. This and, the, and these numbers don't include the non-registered community that is also accessing the, um, the program. 
This initiative for both independent and collaborative learning, as well as their commitment to share their knowledge with others, demonstrates some of the dedication that these students and alumni have to engage with lifelong learning and to participate in a transformative learning culture. These skills will directly transfer over into their professional lives and are really exemplary of, of what they are um, able to do for the community they will serve. You can learn more about this exciting um, program when Elaine Hall, the organizer of this program and current graduate student at our, at our school, will talk about developing a sustainable learning 2.0 community for students and alumni tomorrow, um, tomorrow evening. So if you're interested, it would be, you should attend. Um, the impact of LIS education is now also global. Libraries around the world are benefiting from the skills and knowledge taught in library and information science skills. By partnering with the profession, library and information uh, science skills have expanded their programming to include virtual internships and virtual study abroad courses. Online library and information science programs also attract students from all over the world to their programs, expanding the global interaction, communication, and learning amongst LIS students, faculty, and libraries worldwide. As I said in my opening comments, we are amidst one of the most dynamic and transformational periods of time in the field of library and information science. Providing technology is now libraries' top priority as they redefine their roles as digital knowledge workers, as stated by McKendrick. This shall not burden us. It should excite us. Libraries that adopt a vision for themselves as a technological hub of their communities, meaning that they integrate technologies, they design creative spaces, they open opportunities for learning and exploration, will thrive. The challenge of the past decade with the influence of the internet, ebooks, and mobile technologies was to justify our presence in the community. That trend is changing. Patrons are now coming to the libraries asking for access, asking for technology, and asking for instruction on how to use these technologies. LIS professionals must be technologically knowledgeable and skilled in these technologies and their myriad of uses. LIS, LIS education, therefore, must not only prepare graduates who are competent with emerging technologies, they must also provide professional development opportunities for continuous learning. I hope that you will find the sessions you attend um, at the Library 2.013 conference today and tomorrow enlightening and stimulating, and that this global online conference will be one part of your ongoing professional development as you continue to learn and cultivate new skills and competencies in this evolving information technology landscape. Thank you very much, and I hope you are and will enjoy the conference. Thank you. I'd like to open it up now for questions. So if you have a question for Dr. Hirsch, just raise your virtual hand. It's the third icon over. We see, I see a couple so far. Maybe you were trying to clap. Uh, but the virtual hand icon is the third icon over, and it's a hand if you're clapping. You just hover over the smiley face and the pause button. You can also put a question in the chat, and I will grab those and manage them for her. So, Student X, you now have microphone, microphone capability if you want to turn your mic on. It'd be worth applauding. Okay, so Marty, you have the microphone now if you'd like to. Click on the talk button at the top left. And maybe clapping as well. Okay. No, no. Please go ahead. You are eagerly trying to get a question. Like, no, this hand is down, so maybe she was trying to clap as well. Okay. Love to I get some questions. If you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat, or you can raise your virtual hand. So, do you see the question uh, from Julie in the chat? Sandy. Oh, no, I missed it. I'm sorry. Let's see. 
Um, no, okay. The 23 things only available to SLIS students and alumni? Um, I believe that you can check out the 23 things. Um, uh, I think, Elaine, you, you're on the, um, I think you, I saw you in the room. Can you respond? I see her. I think she'll be typing. Yes, I believe, I believe it, it is. Yes, okay, I see a question about virtual internships. Um, so uh, our school offers something, um, offers these virtual internships and basically they provide um, our students, um, our school is 100% online and uh, so our students are all over the world and sometimes the opportunities that they're interested in can be performed um, through um, virtual means as opposed to physically going to a place to conduct an internship. So we've had a variety of um, in virtual internships that, for example, we've had a, one student I think lived in the U.S. and provided uh, virtual reference services, online reference services to the Women's College in Dubai. And we've had students who perform uh, virtual internships providing um, project or other kinds of um, activities through um, in, their, in libraries of different types. We've had uh, vir virtual interns that have worked for companies like Credo Reference. So they've provided a, a range of services. And it's very exciting because a lot of the work today that, um, that we do in libraries is done in a in a distributed way. So this provides students with those kinds of um, activities and skills that will serve them well. Um, okay, so, so I, put some more I questions saw a whole bunch the, of things fly by. I'm sorry, I put questions in the moderator tab that came up so that you wouldn't have to scroll back to them. Oh, thank you. Uh, let's see. I'm curious to know how you access and measure that San Jose State students that have a grasp on emerging technologies after going through the program. Yeah, so um, I mentioned how we, there's competency that we have uh, for a mastery of uh, knowledge of emerging technologies um, as one of the competencies they have to have to graduate. So one of the ways that we measure that is that every student in our program is required to, um, to uh, has to go through a culminating experience that's called um, an e-portfolio. And this e-portfolio um, is something where um, students actually have 15 different competencies they have to master. That technology one is just only one of 15. And as part of that e-portfolio, at the end of their program, they have to show evidence that they have learned um, and, and uh, mastered that competency. So they actually collect that evidence all the way through the program, either through their assignments, through their internships through their other kinds of experiences and then uh, write about that in a reflective way and that is evaluated by one of our instructors. So this is uh, one of their advisors. So that's how we, um, that's how we, uh, that's how we assess and measure that. Uh, so I see another question um, that is um, an incoming um, student uh, at, at San Jose State. What is your top piece of advice for someone starting out in this profession? I would say that um, I think the top piece of advice I have is to be excited about um, the changes that our profession and the field is offering and to put yourself out there to take advantage of different types of leadership opportunities and um, engage and build your professional network. Uh, take those, do an internship. I recommend all students um, and do an internship, virtual or in person, it doesn't matter. Um, and to um, experiment and try different types of courses um, because there's so many uh, broad range of opportunities that that um, that our field encompasses that 
didn't exist when I went to school many years ago, and it's pretty exciting. So some of the new courses that we offer, for example, are thing, um, we just hired somebody uh, in big data um, for information visualization or in cybersecurity, and these are kinds of areas that are um, where the jobs are and um, also are kind of exciting hot areas for the field and the profession. Other, other questions? I'm going to move to the slide that gives the badge code and before Connected Educator Month. You can keep taking questions, but I thought I should do so at this stage. Okay, that's fine. Are there opportunities at San Jose State for professional internship? Yeah. Yes, there are. If you're a student in our program, then yes, you can get an internship. You can do an internship as part of the program. But no, not as somebody who's already part of the profession, no. But if you're in the profession, there are lots of ways to get um, different kinds of opportunities through professional associations. You can put yourself out there to uh, try to uh, manage, uh, take on some leadership role there to, uh, and to uh, lead a project, uh, and um, that will help develop some of your skills as well. Other questions or comments? Did you see the one from Jill? Oh, no. How, how do MLS holders update their skills with these new courses without paying? Right. So there are several ways. Um, so some, you're saying asking for people who are already in the, in the field, who are already working professionals. Um, well, one way that I mentioned, but it does involve some uh, finance, uh, paying some thousands of dollars, is that if you want to get in-depth learning, you can do that through um, a postmaster certificate program, and that, but that will cost some money, and that takes quite, you know, an investment of time. So that would, would be one way for a deep immersion. But there's a growing number of opportunities, such as MOOCs, um, that are being offered in our field. As I mentioned in the presentation, we have the hyperlinked libraries MOOC, which is already underway. But there's a free component of that. So that would be one way to really engage um, and learn and develop new skills. Indiana University offered a MOOC um, related to information visualization. And Syracuse has offered a MOOC that's free for people who are interested in the new librarianship model and also in the area of data sciences. So there are a number of opportunities like that that would be helpful. And there are increasing numbers of those that are coming. I know that University of Toronto is getting ready to offer um, a MOOC um, that's focused on advocacy, for example. So that would be another opportunity. And then there's all the professional associations and other types of um, training organizations that have pretty inexpensive workshops and uh, program and short courses and uh, colloquia and other kinds of things that you could do for uh, small amounts of money. And, um, and so those are just some ideas, but they're um, to get you started. I'd be happy to talk to you further about that if you have more questions. Uh, I see Cindy asked, any thoughts on recent article about there still being concerns about online MLIS degrees? Um, not sure exactly which article you're referring to, but um, I think you're asking um, whether, like, are you asking about a comparison between the, the online MLIS degree versus an in-person degree? Because if so, um, is that, let me know if that's what it is. But if that's what you are asking, I'll just assume that is, then uh, I would say that there's, there's, 
there's really no difference. I mean, all the, um, the online MLIS degree is accredited by the same accrediting body as, uh, a, you know, an in-person program. Um, and actually, the online MLIS degree offers many advantages over the um, in-person programs in the sense that you're also, in addition to learning great content, not having to, to move um, and to give you the flexibility that an online program does, it doesn't sacrifice any of the interactivity or the community building or anything like that, but it also helps you prepare you to learn and function in a society that it, and in a profession that is increasingly working in online environments. So you will um, be very proficient and um, competent and, and marketable with an online MLIS degree, and there's absolutely no difference in the content and in the quality of those programs. So I hope that was your question. And, but if it wasn't and you had a different aspect that you wanted to focus on, I'm happy to answer that. I'm not seeing uh, another oh one. Yeah, that, I saw, I saw Cindy, I see now that you were asking about employers still having concerns. We're not finding that at all, by the way. That we're not seeing evidence of that at all. And the reality is so many of the LIS programs are, have online components now that employers will catch up very shortly. But I have, we have not heard that or seen evidence of that. I'm sorry, Steve, what were you going to say? I just wanted you to know that I thought there was time for maybe one more question. Oh, okay. Um, one more, one more question. If you have a question for Dr. Hirsch, you can put it in the chat, or you can raise your virtual hand, and we'll give you the microphone. We are coming up on our next set of sessions. They may appreciate a four-minute break. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Before we can the next let them go. We can let them go. Thank you so much. You've been a great audience, and I hope you have a wonderful time at the conference, and um, thank you for attending. Thank you. Enjoy. Thanks, everybody. What a great way to kick off the Library 2.013 conference. We do have a whole set of sessions, seven of them, eight of them, if you count the Hungarian one, eight sessions coming up in the next hour. Please go to library2013.com, look for the schedule and attending page. Love to have you join us in some more sessions. Take care, everybody. Bye now.